Hello, my name is Kelly Burkhardt, and I'm the pastor here at Baptist Temple. I want to warmly welcome you to this hour of worship here on this 16th Sunday after Pentecost. The focus of our service today will be on the, the grace and the generosity of God. Now, during this time when the prelude is being played, I encourage you to focus your, your mind's attention and your heart's affection on God. lesson today comes from Matthew chapter 20 beginning at verse 1 for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard after agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage he sent them into his vineyard when he went out about nine o'clock he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and he said to them you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around and he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also 
received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Once upon a time, Jesus said, there was a man who owned a vineyard, acres and acres of grapes. And so far, during this particular growing season, the weather had been just perfect, with warm, sunny days and brisk, cool evenings, the ideal combination. Well, it was just ideal to make those grapes ripen to perfection. But as he sat down for dinner one Monday evening and clicked on the TV, he heard some rather 
ominous news. According to the weatherman, the, the first frost of the year was predicted to arrive before the end of the week. Well, of course, that sent the owner of the vineyard into a panic. After all, a frost would wipe him out and send him to the poorhouse. So when he went to bed that night, he set his alarm for 5 o'clock a.m. And by the crack of dawn, Tuesday morning, he was in his red pickup truck heading for town in search of as many workers as he could find so that he could get all of those grapes harvested before the cold weather arrived. When he got to town, uh, where into the square where the available workers usually gathered, he hopped out of his truck and, and started to bargain with the guys who were standing there and finally reached a deal with a dozen men and they agreed to work for him all day for $120. So he loaded them into the back of his truck and he whisked them off to the vineyard so that they could get to work. But just as the workers got started, the owner turned on the 6 a.m. news, and when the AccuWeather forecast came on, the vineyard owner started to break out in a cold sweat. The, the forecast had suddenly changed. A high-pressure system was moving in from Canada, which meant the skies would become totally clear that night, probably causing the temperatures to fall below freezing. So as soon as the owner heard that news, he raced back into town to hire some more workers, figuring that he didn't have one second to lose. When he got back to the town square this time, he, he didn't waste any time dickering with the workers about wages. He just yelled, hop in. At the end of the day, I'll pay you what's fair. And he did that all day long, shuttling workers out to his vineyards at 9 a.m. and at noon and again at 3. But when the sun started, to get low in the sky, the owner realized that he needed even more workers if he was going to get all of the grapes in on time. So he hustles back to town one more time in search of grape pickers, but by now all of the regular workers had either been hired or had gone home for the day. The only people the owner saw on the streets was a rather motley group of young men and women with leather jackets and pierced noses and purple hair. And they weren't, they weren't exactly your typical grape pickers, but the owner thought to himself, well, I've got to take them. He's in a very dis desperate situation. So he begged them to hop into his truck, offering like he did to the others to, to pay them what was fair when the workday was over. Well, now, of course, throughout the day, the various workers started wondering what their pay was going to be. After all, the, the workers who started first had a firm contract. They knew that they would be getting $120. But the others had left the exact amount of their pay open, trusting that, that the vineyard owner would treat them fairly. Of course, you can imagine when word got around it, that the owner had agreed to pay that first set of workers $120 for probably about 12 hours of work from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Well, the other workers could do the easy math and concluded that they were making about $10 per hour. And so those that started at 9 a.m. in the morning, they, they were putting in about nine hours of work and figured they'd be getting $90. And the noon arrivals figured they'd be getting $60 for six hours of work. And the three o'clock arrivals calculated that they'd be getting $30 for their three hours out in the fields. Well, at 6 p.m., just as the last grape was picked from the vines, the whistle blew and the workday was over. Right away, one of the workers who'd only been there for an hour ran right up to the front of the line to collect his pay. But when he took his envelope and opened it, he was shocked to find $120 inside. So what did he do? Did he go back to the owner and confess that some sort of error must have been made? Maybe he had been mistaken for one of those who had worked all day. No, the worker just smiles and 
keeps right on walking. And right behind him, the, the next worker opened his pay envelope and found the exact same thing, $120. Now, when the workers at the back of the line got word about what was going on, they started to get pretty excited. They, they began to figure that the owner must have changed his, his pay rate. So now, instead of just paying $120 per day, he was paying maybe $120 per hour. At the 9 a.m. and the noon and the 3 o'clock workers, they opened their envelopes, also found $120. Finally, those workers who had been there all day, they came up to the owner, figuring that he was going to give them, well, their $120 like they had, had agreed upon, but probably also something a little extra for them for working all day. After all, they, they were the ones who had been, well, who had really given the owner a full day of work. And when they peeked into their envelopes, what did they find? Well, they found that they were paid $120 just like all of the rest. And so, being more than just a little exasperated, those workers, they marched up to the owner and said, What's going on? We worked here all day long, slaving away in your field, and we got $120. And those sorry workers that you picked up late in the day, well... They got the same $120 that we did. How could you do that? How could you possibly treat them equal to us? But the owner answered by saying, look, friend, now what's actually going on here in this moment is really interesting. In verse 13, it, it begins with this word, friend. It, but what you need to know is that, well, th th this is a... This is a pretty interesting way that the owner is addressing this disgruntled worker because, well, here, this Greek word that's behind this, our English word friend, it, it often has this rather negative connotation. It's actually the, the same word for friend that, that Jesus uses. For example, when Judas arrives to betray him, he says, greetings, friend. It's the same word for friend that Jesus uses in another parable, the one where the king gives a great banquet. But one of the attendees disgraces the party by showing up in ratty clothes. So the king marches up to this fellow and says, hey, friend, who let you in dressed like that? And so here the owner is saying, hey, friend, hey, pal, hey, Mac, we agreed on $120 and, and that's what you got. That was the deal that we agreed on. That's what you've earned. And if it makes me happy to be generous to other people and give them more than they maybe deserve, then what's that to you? It's an interesting story. But what does it mean for us? Well, I think it means a lot of things, and we'll explore some of this more fully in the next two sections of, of my sermon later in the service. But... It's probably important to end this section with a brief description about at least what part of the meaning might be. The concept of the carrot and the stick, it's, it's basic to human relationships. From infancy, we learn that if we behave well, that we will be rewarded, and if we, if we behave badly, we'll be punished. However, as mature humans, as adults, it, it often becomes obvious to us that that the rule doesn't always apply. And sometimes our good deeds, well, they're either ignored or they're badly repaid. And just as often our bad behavior, it eludes punishment. The story that we just went over together, it highlights the fact that, that, that our sense of justice is often highly subjective. Most of us never complain about injustice when it falls in our favor. If we're playing cards and one of the players has dealt four aces, they never call for a redeal, say, say, look, this isn't fair. I have this incredible hand. Let's start over. We never do that sort of thing. It's not the way human nature works. Those who 
become most upset at the end of the day. They, they had no complaints when things had broke their way, but, but we also understand that and we also identify with their outrage that they have at the end of this parable. That they worked all day and did substantially more than the others. And what if the whole world worked this way? Don't you imagine that if everyone was going to get equal pay regardless of when they showed up to work or regardless of how hard they worked when they got there, the people would probably always sleep in late and come to the labor pool late in the afternoon. The owner's action, they, 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 they upset the whole arrangement of societal order that's based on equal pay for equal work. After all, they could understand the vineyard owner's generosity to the workers who came afternoon, perhaps, if, if, those, if that group of workers had merely been delayed, if the, the truck that brought them to the field had, had maybe broken down on the way. But, but the owner's actions, they're not the side of a little bit of generosity to an unfortunate few. It's just plain crazy to give everyone the same pay when, when some worked much longer and harder than others. On face value, this seems to be absolutely wrong and not fair at all. So, at least initially, I think it's difficult for us to get our hearts and our minds around the purpose of this parable, what Jesus really meant when he told this story, but hopefully we will be able to make more sense of it together later in the service. Until then, let us pray. Almighty God, thank you for these moments when we have drawn aside from the hustle and bustle of life in order to be reminded of greater things, of nobler things, of loftier things. We gather to celebrate the power of your kingdom and to contemplate the depth of your grace. We ask you to forgive us if today or any other day if we've strolled too casually into your holy presence. Forgive us when we have come singing of your reign on high while being distracted by things below. And forgive us when we've mouthed the words of eternal forgiveness even as we have privately rehearsed our paybacks for earthly slights. Draw our eyes upward, O oh God, and help us to look heavenward to see what your kingdom can be. Help us to look toward Christ to see what we can become. We also ask that you would not permit us to only look heavenward. Help us to see the world around us, a world in need, in desperate need of you. Show us people in need of your love and our prayers that are a part of our daily routines. And open our hearts, O oh God, to the needs that are all around us and help us to do what we can to make a difference and may your spirit minister to them in ways that we cannot. And now we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
Gift becomes our central focus. It forever changes how we interpret things. If entitlement is our vantage point, we evaluate the particulars of our lives from that perspective. On the other hand, if, if grace is our starting point, everything begins to appear in a very different light. If you want to be miserable, then compare what you have to what some others have. Invariably, there will always be someone who, who may not have worked as hard as you, yet, yet wound up with very different and better circumstances. If you base your evaluating on the sidelong comparative angle, I guarantee you that it will always wind up making you miserable. Grace is always amazing grace. And always completely illogical. Grace that can be calculated. Grace that can be rationed out. Grace that can be expected and demanded. It's no longer grace. This parable, it emphasizes the scandalous nature of God's amazing grace. So although the wage comes only to those who heed the call to work in his field. They're not, they're not treated according to their, to their individual merits, but according to their needs. God pays his servants not based on the time they have worked or the quality of work or even their worthiness, but he rewards us according to his grace. So we should all avoid the temptation to compare our lot in life with someone else. And God's kingdom rewards are not given out to those with seniority or those who produce the most success. God is like that vineyard owner who actually gives us all more than we deserve. We are all fortunate that God does not deal with us on the basis of strict justice and fairness because none of us are deserving of anything from God. God's gifts are gen generously Distributed, they are not earned. All receive the, a full day's pay. It is the minimum. Nothing less would be sufficient. But it's also the maximum. Nothing more is possible. In the whole process of evaluation, the, the selection of criteria is always absolutely crucial. You may have heard about the man who went to work on Monday morning and ritualistically asked his, his boss, how's your wife? And he was startled when his, his boss shot back, compared to what? <laughs> well, you don't have to be a philosopher to realize that the question here is fairly basic. You see, compared to a, a movie star, the, the boss might answer that question, how's your wife, one way. Compared to Mother Teresa, he, he might respond in a completely different way altogether. Any interpretation, it hinges on the criteria that you choose. And this is the crucial meaning that Jesus is trying to convey in this parable. If I compare what I had before March 14, 1975, the day I was born, if I compare what I had before that day, then, then all of my particulars of my life, they look wonderful in relation to being nothing before I was born. This mind and this body and my place in history, they are a windfall compared to never existing at all. However, if I was com to compare my physical appearance to someone like Channing Tatum or compare my mind to someone like Stephen Hawking or to compare my possessions and what I have to someone like Bill Gates, what I am and, 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 and what I have, it begins to look utterly different. The only fail-safe recipe for joy in our lives is to regard all of it as a gift. Fail-safe recipe for misery, it's comparing our lot to someone else's and forgetting what grace really is. The Old Testament reading today comes from Psalm 105, 
beginning at verse 1. O give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
in this parable that we've been looking at today, obviously the, the vineyard owner is meant to be a metaphor for, for God. But I think that there may be more to it than that as well. That that vineyard owner may also point us to the way of what our human potential might be. In the end, this vineyard owner was not a, a perpetrator of injustice, but rather a model for how wealth can be used creatively and compassionately. What he did for the last four groups of workers, it was motivated by sensitivity and concern, not abstract justice. He realized that all of the people in the labor pool on that day, they, they had families to feed and needed the money of a full day's pay. He was thinking about them, not the service that they had provided for him. It, it was generosity, not, not the concept of fairness that accounts for his action. Generosity it goes beyond justice. It goes beyond fairness. The owner of the vineyard likely chose to, to be generous to those that he hired last because, well, because he knew of their need. The grumblers are not reacting to injustice. They're reacting to generosity. And they don't have any right to complain about that. As I've been thinking about this concept of generosity and it being at least part of our own human potential, showing us that modeling ourselves after God's behavior. I thought some about my friend Vance Gabrzowski. Uh, he was a person, in my opinion, who, who knew about this kind of generosity and way of living, and he, he lived it out very well until his untimely death in 2009. Vance was the maintenance man here at Baptist Temple for about four and a half years, and then he suddenly and unexpectedly passed away at the age of 38 years old. He was a guy who had a troubled past, but had turned over a new leaf, and Vance was a little rough around the edges, and he was far from perfect, but he became a real important fixture here at our church, and he, be he was a good friend to me. Vance was one of the most gifted people I've ever known. He barely graduated from, from high school, but the truth of the matter is, there is no doubt in my mind that he was a true genius. I've heard people in churches and businesses all over the place say that they've got a guy who can fix anything, but I'll tell you, none of those guys can fix things like Vance could. And he would often fix things in the most astonishingly creative ways. It really didn't matter what the problem might be. If you gave Vance a little time, he would have a solution to that problem and maybe a, a few that you never even were aware of. It didn't, it, it, this was the kind of thing that Vance did so often, but what I came to learn about Vance that, was that his ability to solve problems and fix things was not his only extraordinary quality that he possessed. I came to discover how, how generous he could also be. He was generous with his time, he was generous with his help, and even though he didn't have a whole lot, he was always generous with whatever he had. He was the kind of guy who would give you the shirt off of his own back and would never, ever really expect anything in return. In the days after his passing, I spent a lot of time down in his little tool room. Um, and as I was down there, uh, mostly just trying to look for tools that were probably hidden somewhere in that room so that I could try and fill in a few of the small gaps that he had left behind in his absence. I, I happened to notice one day this, this little card that was hanging on his bulletin board. It, it, it simply says, do good and share what you have, Hebrews 3, 13, 16. And I've had it in my office ever since that day when I found it. I, I'm not real sure where the little note came from, and, but it's clear to me that those words must have meant something to him because he didn't have anything else like that on his bulletin board. But I didn't have to see that little note to know that Vance believed those words, do good and share what you have. One of the last conversations I had with him was 
about my plans to do some, some grilling over the weekend. And he knew that I thought the best kind of smoke that you can produce for, for grilling is mesquite wood. It's what every guy from West Texas believes. And, and, and he asked if I had it. Well, I usually keep a small pile of mesquite wood on hand, but I'd run out and, and, and was going to use some, some oak that I usually put in my fireplace inside. But he insisted that that wasn't good enough and that he'd bring some mesquite wood the next day that he had at his house. I told him it was nice, I, but I absolutely insisted that he should not do that. He said okay and disappeared from my doorway that day. But the next day when I was getting in my truck to head home, I noticed that the entire back end of my truck was filled with this big pile of mesquite wood. It's just one of the many stories I could tell you about my friend Vance doing good and sharing what he had. And I think it's the kind of thing that you and I ought to do too. Because when we do this kind of thing, when we do good and share what we have, we are imitating the same kind of grace and the same kind of generosity that God extends to us. And it removes that temptation to feel entitled. Rather than operating from a position of entitlement and scarcity, wouldn't you rather live a life that is characterized by a profound awareness that that you are the recipient of God's lavish love and his amazing grace and that there is absolutely no end to his abundance. It's virtue, it's beautifully illustrated in a Jewish parable that I read in one of John Claypool's books. It's a parable about a father and two sons and the father was an ideal mentor. He took his boys to the fields as soon as they were big enough to walk and taught them everything he knew about farming. When he died, instead of dividing their inheritance, well, they decided instead to just continue working together as partners, each contributing his best gifts and dividing every harvest down the middle. One of the brothers was married and had eight children. The other brother remained a bachelor. One night during a particularly bountiful harvest, the bachelor brother thought to himself, my brother has 10 mouths to feed and I only have one. He really needs more of this harvest than I do. However, I know him. He's much too fair to renegotiate our agreement. I know what I'll do. I'll take some of my harvest and I'll, I'll slip it over into his barn at night so that he'll have more for his family. At that very same time, the married brother was thinking to himself, God has blessed me with this fine family. My, my children will, will take care of me when I am old. But my brother's not as fortunate. He really needs more of this harvest to provide for his old age. But, but I know him. He's far too fair to renegotiate our agreement. I, I know what I'll do. I'll take some of my harvest and slip it over into his barn at night and build up his nest egg for the future. Or as you might have anticipated, one night when the moon was full, these brothers came face to face, each on a mission of generosity. The old rabbi who told this story originally said that although there was not a cloud in the sky, a gentle rain began to fall. And do you know what it was? It was God weeping for joy because two of his children had gotten the point that the real secret to, to human joy is sharing what we have with others rather than hoarding everything for ourselves. I imagine the same God wept for joy over the actions of the vineyard owner that late afternoon. He too had modeled what it meant to be made in the image of a generous God. And the truth is that we are all chips off of that same beloved block. Jesus told this story because the kingdom of heaven is like this. May we all be part of his kingdom 
coming, his will being done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus leaves us with a question. Can we learn to see the world we live in through the eyes of God? Because our ideas of right and wrong, of what is just and what is unjust, and they're not necessarily God's ideas. And that's actually a really good thing. Because when we look for fairness and equality, we are always instead surprised to find generosity. This parable reminds us that God is a lousy bookkeeper and it invites us to transform our pride and our envy and our hardness and our sense of entitlement into joy by admiring and celebrating and participating in God's astounding generosity. God's love is, is there for all. Maybe that's not fair, but it's grace. And grace is what is needed now more than anything else in this world. We need to receive God's abundant grace for ourselves and extend that to every single person around us whenever it is possible. Amen.
Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and grant you peace. May the Lord give you the grace to never sell yourself short, grace to risk something big for something good, and grace to remember that the world is now too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. Now may you take your minds and think through them. May you take your lips and speak through them. And may you take your hearts and set them on fire in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.